number 22, William Gay. Uh, he's one of the more intelligent players that I've ever coached. Broken up by William Gay. Intelligent, talented, determined. Will is a special person. A special person who has a Super Bowl championship ring. Like all Steelers, he frustrates fans at times, and other times he makes them deliriously happy while looking back on a painfully unhappy period of his childhood. I love this game. I've been through way more stuff. More stuff than any eight-year-old boy should endure. Will loved his mom. His world was shattered when his stepfather murdered her, and while the memories of that awful day still haunt him. I thought life was over with, with itself. Like, how my mom get taken away from me? What did I do? I always imagine her or what she'll look like today. <laughs> Thanks, William. Will Gay has slowly but surely achieved happiness again. I'm William Gay, and tonight I stand before you not only as a Pittsburgh Steeler, but as a child witness, a survivor, and an advocate. An advocate who volunteers and inspires, not as a celebrity athlete, but as a survivor. I'm putting her story out, so I want to do everything I can do. He joins police, prosecutors, survivors, all those making a difference in stopping intimate partner violence. And the young kids just look at him with just like, Wow, here's a man that's not yelling. Here's a man that's not being abusive. And it's making a difference. Will's story, a Steelers stand against domestic violence. On a cool late spring evening at the historic Frick property in Point Breeze. Gourmet food, music, and auction, dedicated volunteers and survivors of intimate partner violence, they all come together to celebrate what's called four decades of courage, strength, and hope. It's the annual fundraiser for the Women's Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh. The Women's Center and Shelter is a program that provides a variety of service to victims of intimate partner violence and their children. <laughs> At this year's event, many guests approach a young man, smartly dressed in a blue suit, pink shirt, and they thank him for going public. So it's, it's, it's just an honor to meet you and everything that you've been through. We can relate. <laughs> yeah, that's a, and that's a great thing y'all doing. Um, that, the Women's Center helped me open up. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about it, because they helped me grow as a man. What yeah. helped him was talking openly in television public service announcements that seemed to grip Western Pennsylvania. I'm William Gay of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I lost my mother to domestic violence. There are too many kids out there just like me. Please. Do what you can to help the Women's Center and Shelter stop the violence. I'm not a big football fan, but you're my favorite player. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> Will Gay is not at the party as a Pittsburgh Steelers celebrity. He's here to be with his many friends from the Women's Center and Shelter. He knows them well. He sees them often. He buys large dinners, brings his teammates and friends to serve the meals to domestic violence survivors living temporarily at the center. Right. Will Gay's boss, Steelers President Art Rooney II, came to this fundraiser to celebrate the work of the center and to express deep pride in Will Gay. It certainly takes some courage to do what, uh, what Will has done in terms of uh, really uh, being willing to talk about the very sensitive part of his life and uh, something that uh, I'm sure it was difficult for him to, to, uh, to talk about. Will serves as master of ceremonies. We are gathered to celebrate the accomplishments of the past four decades and to look ahead to the future. We are on our hope, the many survivors in the room and those who are no longer with us. Please let us take a brief moment of silence to remember those who have lost their lives to the intimate partner violence. Will Gay undoubtedly remembers his own mother.
What do you remember about your mother? Oh man, she was a, a sweet lady. As a bright-eyed, smiling little boy growing up in Tallahassee, Florida, young Will Gay was very close to his mom, Carolyn Hall. These were the good days, his mom smiling at a summer picnic. Gay, the middle child, says he and his two stepbrothers never knew they were poor because their mom did whatever she could to keep the boys happy and out of trouble. She was very strict and made sure that we was at school no matter what the situation was. I mean, one time she was ready to walk us to school when the car was broken down. Somebody needed some money, she'll, she'll give it to him. As he reflects on his childhood, looking through a family album, Will Gay knows now that his mom shielded the boys from knowing that she was in an abusive relationship with her husband, Will's stepfather. They did pretty good. If they were fussing or fighting, uh, my younger brother and my older brother, we all didn't know about it. All of a sudden, this day came. All of a sudden. And it came because she got to a point that she was ready to leave, mm -hmm. ready to divorce him and get out of the marriage. But he wasn't going to let that happen. Well, we thought he was. But on March 14th, 1992. We went to my grandmother's house, and she dropped us off over there. His mom, Carolyn, dropped off her sons, then met her husband to break off their relationship. He shot her in the head, then turned the gun on himself. He died instantly. Will's mom was rushed to the hospital and lived for only about four hours. Did you get to see her? Nah, uh, that's, that's the, the thing that I regret. And I don't know if my uncles and grandmother, they just, oh, you too young, you don't need to see. Like, I didn't go in the room. I didn't even go to the funeral. So that kind of, I think that's going to eat me up for the rest of my life. I was in shock, um, didn't believe it. Uh, I was like, yeah, my mom coming home. But as the hours went by, the days went by, nah, she wasn't coming back. So at first I just was quiet, you know, I didn't know what to do. I thought life was over with, with itself. Like how my mom get taken away from me? What did I do? So I had to go through life or those years thinking of that question. So you had feelings of blame, blaming yourself almost? Uh, just, just wondering why. Um, you know, you always, you never want to get to the point where you ask God why. But at that point, I was asking why, why me, why I couldn't be somebody else. Um, like I said, what did I do wrong? Um, I thought I was a good kid. My mom supposed to live forever. And so, you, you know, you go as a child thinking that. You know, at that time, like I said, I just thought the world was over with. It's often what children of domestic abuse go through, self-blaming. After the murder, Will and his brothers moved in with their grandmother. Will became bitter, hateful. As a teenager, he began to act out. You were a good kid, a good up to eight years old. This happens, then things sort of went to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. I didn't care about life. I, teacher tell me, oh, you need to do your, your schoolwork and you need to be quiet. And I used to look at him for what? I don't have a mom. And I, I, I chose to use that aggression towards, you know, being bad. I felt like I'm acting out since the world didn't care about me, why I should care about the world. And I mean, I, I went on for like four years like that until my uncle just, you know, sat me down because my grandma, like I said, couldn't control me. And she was like, somebody got to do something or he's going to be out of control for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. and my uncle just used sports against me. It was like, if you get kicked out of school or nobody want to deal with you, you can't play football. When I realized I couldn't play football, I was like, oh, okay, well, I can't do this. His choice of staying with football over staying in the streets eventually brought years of success in high school, college, and of course in the NFL. Number 22, William Gay. He gives the credit to God and to his late mother. Will believes his mom saved his life, that she knew something bad could happen that day, and that's why she dropped off Will and his brothers before confronting her abusive husband. It's possible you could have been in that house when this happened. 
uh, I mean, I think about that every day. The only reason he didn't come in and kill us is because we was at my grandmother's house and my mother wasn't there. If she was there, I think he would have killed all three of us, my mother and himself. So I, I think about that all the time. And so that's why I try to live my life to, to not only just to be obedient to God, because he gave me a chance. Mm -hmm. And that's how I look at it. God had a plan for you. God had a plan. It took years, but Will Gay began to talk publicly about what happened. He believes opening up relieved him of feelings of blame, guilt, and shame. Isn't part of that plan, Will, to not just go to the Women's Center in Pittsburgh and serve some chicken, it's to sit there and tell them what happened. And, and not only tell them what happened, um, to listen to their stories. Because like I told them, when I sit down and talk to the different women or, and hear dis different situations, I call them heroes. Because they did something that my mama couldn't do. When I hear those stories, I just tell them, man, that y'all are the true heroes. I mean, me being here, I don't bring no cameras. I don't like no cameras to come up there. I just wanted to be a true, genuine conversation between me and the family that's there, playing with the kids. Yeah, we're going to have dinner, but I just want to sit here. I don't have nowhere to go. The staff has, they have panic button mm -hmm. for the police mm -hmm. in case anybody tries to get mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. The Women's Center and, so and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh, the place Will Gay volunteers, doesn't usually welcome TV cameras. It's a high security building. CEO Cheryl Regan granted us access as long as we didn't show victims' faces or reveal this location. Here we sit at the Women's Center, but we can't divulge where we are. No. Why? Well, because it's dangerous. Women who come to a shelter who are victims of intimate partner violence, are actually in danger of their lives. At least once a month, abusers somehow find out where this place is, and they try to break into this property. And so we have to call the police all the time. So we have excellent security here, because it's a really dangerous situation for the women who live here. And for their children. The center is a place with teddy bears and toys, Colorful quilts hang on the walls with messages of hope and support. It's a warm and welcoming place where survivors and their children live safely. It's always at capacity given that one in four women in the United States will become victims of intimate partner violence. Which doesn't discriminate based on where you live, who you are, or how much you have. So we're going to go into what we call our distribution center. And when we're working with victims of domestic violence, they usually come to shelter with nothing because the police bring them. And so we have to provide and make sure that we have diapers. We have lotion. The, see, all of toothpaste this, and, and hair shampoo. shampoo. Everything that you take for granted in your home, we have here, including some jackets, some winter clothing. This is all donated by people in the community. It's kind of heartbreaking to see children's clothes mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the police are bringing them in after yes. an incident. Yes, they yes. They can't bring everything. They can't bring everything. They usually don't bring anything. Mm -hmm. And so they have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. I see Halloween costumes, mm -hmm. but they're only allowed to trick or treat inside the building. Only allowed in the building. The center, says Regan, does so much more than house survivors safely. It empowers them with education, legal advocacy, and more to live a safe and happy life. They also assist Pittsburgh police and the Allegheny County DA's office to prevent violence before it starts with this new prevention tool called the Lethality Assessment Screening. At domestic violence calls, police officers have potential victims answer the questions. We go through some of them with Deputy District Attorney David Spurgeon, who leads the domestic violence unit here. Number one, has he or she ever used a weapon against you or threatened you with a weapon? And each answer is yes, no, not answerable. 
Number two, has he or she threatened to kill you or your children? Wow. Number three, do you think he or she might try to kill you? This is pretty involved. It is, and if you answer yes to any of those three, it's an automatic high danger assessment. Okay. So any one of those three, then they're supposed to connect to a hotline okay. as a result of that. If, if they don't answer any of those three, then they move on to the next four. There are 11 questions. Answering yes to at least four, has a police officer put a potential victim in contact with a shelter immediately? There's always the opportunity for a shelter via a police officer. Many of the shelters will even send a taxi cab to the location. I am so excited about this project that I think it's probably one of the best things that's happened to reaching victims in 40 years. In its first year of the lethality screening, Pittsburgh police officers expect to put an average of 1,000 people into shelter. Sergeant Eric Kroll trains recruits at the police academy. Domestic violence is a lot like a fire. Um, it, it starts with just an ember, and if it's allowed to continue, it will grow. The goal of a, of a police officer is to try and stop that cycle of violence and, and to take that person out of the situation, basically putting that fire out. I often tell the recruits that the, a domestic violence situation is one that you're, you're going to act upon. Uh, you may save a person's life and you may never know it. Um, they may not even know it, but you're taking them out of that danger situation. What we know is that leaving an abusive relationship is the most dangerous time for the victim in that relationship. That is when most homicides take place. Too many, like Will Gay's mom, lose their lives or become violently victimized. I was scared to death. And lucky to be alive to tell the story behind this shocking front page picture. The Post-Gazette headline, Police Shoot Man in Hostage Siege. He shot at me at least six times. Deborah Murphy was shot and terrorized for three hours inside her Brookline home. Her estranged husband, David Thompson, like most abusers, wanted to punish his former intimate partner or make sure no one else could have her after the separation. On August 10th, 2002, he dropped off their two children, three-year-old daughter Courtney and one-year-old son Connor, after a court-ordered child visitation. A few minutes later, there's a noise on the back porch. I go down, see what the noise is, because there were no stairs at the back porch at the time. I thought it was a toy. So I go down to the back porch. When I get to the back door, he was standing like we both went for the doorknob at the same time. Well, the door happened to be locked, but when he was grabbing for the door, I seen the gun in his hand. So immediately, I'm down 911. I have the lady on the phone. He must have ran back into the backyard, shot the back cellar door, like the glass out, and reached in, opened up the door, came upstairs, and he was standing, it would be like that doorway to here, shooting at me while I'm on the phone with, I still had 911 on the phone. Within a minute, Deborah says police arrived. By that time, Thompson was holding her and the two children at gunpoint. With police surrounding the house, he agrees to let the children go and holds Deborah in an upstairs bedroom with the gun to her head. Uh, while she was on the phone with 911, they could hear shots being fired. Police arrived and the standoff began. The He's telling me, you know, he can't have me, nobody can have me. In the middle of everything, pulls his pants down and has a gun to my head. And rapes you. Right. So that goes on. After he raped Deborah twice, he put the gun to her head and told her and the police negotiator on the phone, this was it, it's over. It's done now, I'm done. I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna kill her. Hung up the phone. Well, they, SWAT team, hit the door. The sound of the bang of the door stopped him. But they must, I don't know, they ran fast because they were upstairs like two snaps. They asked him to drop it maybe three times, he didn't. Then they all kind of crouched together. It was almost like he must have moved, so they all bent down. Well, then he, they shot. Police shot Thompson in the face. He survived and is serving a 28 to 56 year prison sentence for numerous charges related to the incident.
Deborah lived years with anxiety, panic attacks, feelings of guilt, confusion, until, she says, the Women's Center and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh stepped in to help. Just trying to stay strong for my kids, the two babies, so other than that, no, I'm going to be fine. I used to go down for weekly appointments, and the legal advocate, actually, she was a lifesaver in itself, um, very knowledgeable. She explained everything to detail in, I guess, layman's terms. That's going to be so funny. Deborah says she and her daughter and son have gotten on with their lives for the most part. But like most survivors, she must stay connected to the Women's Center. In my eyes, he got 20 years for not killing me. He's going to come back. <laughs> He's definitely going to come back. So that's a huge fear of mine. In the meantime, Deborah Murphy also finds strength and confidence in telling other women not to be afraid to get help. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Do not feel guilty. Um, they're the three things that, or don't ever think that the money's worth it. Never think that the money's worth it because you'll make it up in the long run. She works full time while raising two teenagers and stays active as a Women's Center volunteer for good reason. I thank God every day. I think every day. And I tell the kids that too. I'm, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I mean, I know why I'm here, but there is a reason why it all happened and I survived it. And I think the reason is for me to step out and help other people. So I'm here to help anybody else. And then the center steps in and they make your hope go from very small to very big. <laughs> I can just help one. It'll, it'll help me know that at least you spoke up and said something. 29-year-old advocate Will Gay says he'd give anything to have his mom in the stands at Heinz Field. I always imagine her or what she'll look like today or what, what we'll be doing. Or, how crazy she'll be in the stands yelling for her baby. She'd be proud not only of his talent, but of his courage, because Will Gay himself is also a personal survivor of intimate partner violence. A former girlfriend attacked him in college. By the situation I was in in college, a um, girl pushed me, and my girlfriend, she was pushing me, uh, pointing the finger, you ain't gonna do nothing. I called the police, and I ran outside. Gay never saw her again, and he's in a steady, happy relationship now. This Steelers stand against domestic violence not only draws attention to the problem, it's bringing more people who would otherwise ignore it to talk openly. Do what you can to help the Women's Center and Shelter stop the violence. It's so real, and when he talks about it, you see the pain. You see the the years that he's been carrying these emotions with him and it becomes real for you. You see the impact and yet you also see this incredible human being who has done so well because he's made the decision to do well and to speak out about this issue. And I get tears in my eyes every time I think about it because Will speaking on this topic helps everyone feel the pain of a child losing his mother. Will Gay impacted his best friends, teammates, and mentors about all of this long before the NFL imposed stiffer penalties against domestic violence. The situation he in can help and contribute. Uh, he can relate to the women because he went through it. Um, unfortunately, uh, what happened to him as a young kid, that was very unfortunate, but just them women going through it and him going through his situation, man, the best experience is relating. Even though it's a bad experience, he still can relate to those women. I take it you have great respect for him. Oh, yeah, he like my little brother. Will is an extremely compassionate person. Obviously, he was deeply affected by his own personal experience um, with that. But, um, you know, in just his everyday life, he always shows uh, great leadership, and I learned from him. Uh, but he's a tremendous person and um, he does so much for this community. We're going to have a little bit of both. Will Gay's mentor, NFL Hall of Famer Dick LeBeau, says Will Gay is about the most authentic young man 
he's ever met. I'm not worried about him, let's put it that way. You know, I, I feel very confident that he's going to be a great success after football. But his character uh, would be just sound, solid, smart, and, and caring. When uh, he, he started to talk about it, he realized that it was something that uh, needed to be talked about, needed, needed to be uh, out there and understood. And, and so, uh, again, I think he's uh, shown a lot, of, a lot of strength and, uh, and really a, a lot of you know, willingness to de dedicate his own personal time. All of us here in the, in the Steeler organization are proud of what he's doing and, and certainly uh, try to do whatever we can to, to support him. As a team owner, you have to be gratified he's on this team. Well, you know, uh, we, we were happy that uh, Will was on the team before we even knew that, you know, he, he uh, uh, was willing to share his story. Uh, but uh, certainly that's become something that, uh, is, you know, it's pretty special. And, and again, we, we really admire him and, uh, and uh, just uh, take my hat off to him for, for all he's done. Will Gay says, he will never be silent again. I'm not gonna leave it alone. Um, I'm gonna let any and everybody know um, about it. That is wrong. I mean, point blank period. Um, if you feel like you need to put your hands on a woman, um, you're a coward. And I, I told, I had talked to a group of men and I told them straight up. I said, any dude that puts a hand on a female is a coward. Most people try to hide it because they don't want nobody to look at them crazy. And, and that's what I did for a long time. Definitely don't be scared. Um, get help, because it's, it's people out there that want to help. And it's extended hands everywhere. Go to a friend. Tell a friend, and if that friend cares enough, they will make sure you get help. I hope she's happy, because everything I do, I do it for her. I just want to make her proud. So I, I think, you know, looking down, she probably saying, you did okay for yourself. For more information and resources about domestic violence, go to wqed.org slash domestic violence.